I love it. My, my, my. It sustains me. Amen? Yes, sir. It gives me light in the darkness. The right. Bible says it's a lamp unto our feet right. and a light unto our path. Amen? Amen? The last couple of weeks we've been talking about the heart. Mm -hmm. We're going to go along that way again this morning. Mm -hmm. We began this a couple of weeks ago because of, not necessarily just because of a statement that I heard, but the gym nation said that it's impossible to keep that which is in your heart from having an effect on the way that you live. But because of so much of the uh, <clears throat> language that you hear today coming from not only the world, but from church people. Yes. Matter of fact, you probably hear from more church people than you do All right. uh, the people of the world. Amen. And, uh, and that is that, well, I know that I'm not living right, but God sees my heart. God yeah. knows my heart. Or, Don't judge me. God sees my heart. God knows my heart. All along those lines, you hear it all the yeah. time. And we learned very clearly from the Word of God mm -hmm. that it is indeed impossible to keep that which is in your heart from affecting the way that you live. Amen? Right. We read the Scripture in Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, that tells us that the heart is deceitful yeah. above all things. Come on. And it is desperately wicked. Right. Who can know it? The next verse, verse 10, says, The Lord search the heart. I, the Lord, search the heart. Right. I try the reins, mm -hmm. even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And we learn that what is in our heart affects the way we live. Amen. It affects our decisions. It affects the things that we do. Thus, the Bible says, in his doings. Amen. His ways, the fruit of His doings. It is not possible to separate the two. Although the world would like for you, us to believe that. You know, God looks on the heart. That's a favorite quote of a lot of people. And Amen. He does. You're right. God does look on the heart. But sooner or later, Amen. we need to know that that which is in our heart will make its way to the surface. You cannot harbor hate in your heart without hate affecting the way you live. Right. Amen. It is impossible for you to hold malice True. and hatred and unforgiveness in your heart and it not affect the way that you live. Amen. Amen. And we saw that we, from Jesus, Matthew the 12th chapter, the 33rd uh, verse down to the 35th verse, Jesus speaks these words and I don't know how it could be any plainer than what Jesus said in Matthew 12 and 33. Either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Yes. Now listen where it says the fruit comes from. Where it begins. Where the roots of us is at. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart yeah. the mouth speaketh. Now listen. Verse 35. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart yes. bringeth forth good things. Right. And an evil man out of the evil treasures. Mm. Where? In his heart. That's what Jesus is talking to us about. Yeah. An evil man out of the evil treasures bringeth forth evil things. Amen. Amen. Jesus would say in Matthew 15, 18, and 19, but those things which proceed out of the mouth cometh from the heart. They defile the man. Right. For out of the heart proceed Evil faults, yes. murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false oh. witness. What was Jesus saying? That's where these things begin. Mm -hmm. Many times, most of the time, we try and treat the symptom instead of going to the root of the problem. Amen? Oh. If you go into a doctor's office and you've got some kind of an infection, <laughs> and because of that infection, it is causing you to sneeze, it's causing you to, to, to have a sore throat, it's causing mm -hmm. you can treat just those symptoms. And it would not do any good to get rid of the root of the problem, which is the infection that's in your body. So they give you an antibiotic. What for? Does it, is it for to treat the sneeze? Not necessarily. Is it to treat the sore throat? Not necessarily. Because it's to treat the infection. Once the infection is taken care of, the sore throat will be taken care of. Once the infection is taken, once our heart is taken care of, then, the, then our works and our fruit will begin to fall into place with the Word of God. That led us to King David. Amen. Who we talked about last week. We learned a lot about David's heart last week. Right. We learned that David knew his, his uh, terrible sin with Bathsheba. Amen. And the murder of her husband. 
did not begin just with an action. It didn't just, well, I'm just going to decide to do this to, at, the, at the spur of a moment. No, there was adultery in David's heart. Right. Amen? There was murder in David's heart. And we know this because of his prayer. In Psalms, the 51st chapter, he said, Create in me a clean heart. Yeah. Renew a right spirit right. within me. Yeah. David says in other places, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Right. Because David knew. Mm -hmm. He said, and see if there be any, any wicked way in me. In where? What did he have just told the Lord to do? <laughs> Search me. me. Know my heart. Yeah. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me. Mm -hmm. So we know that David, the Bible teaches us, and we learned last week, was a man after the heart of God. We learn that David was a man that was hungry for God. David had a heart that knew conviction. That's a rare commodity in the day that we live today. Amen. David had a heart that knew repentance. Mm -hmm. That's a rare commodity in the day that we live right. today. David, according to the Bible, had a heart of integrity. Mm -hmm. One scripture we read last week even talked of David's heart as being perfect. All right. And you might scratch your head today and wonder, now wait a minute. David committed adultery. David had Bathsheba's husband killed. Right. And you could stop right there and those scriptures about David's heart of integrity and his heart of, of conviction, all that stuff that we've been talking about might not make no sense to you. But David also had a heart of repentance. All right. Amen. Mm -hmm. The fact is not that you fall down. You're fixing to fall down. Amen. Mm -hmm. The fact is whether you get back up or not. Amen. Mm -hmm. Falling down ain't dead. Amen. Come on. The fact is not are you going to mess up because you are going to mess up. Right. The question is, are you going to repent mm -hmm. and go on? Amen. Mm -hmm. And that's what David did. And that's what God saw in the heart of David. He knew that David was not perfect. Right. He knew. See, he, 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 went, he went looking for the man that was after his heart. Amen. He went looking for a man who had integrity in his heart. He look, right. went looking for a man who had conviction, who had repentance True. in his life. True. Because Saul had done past the point of no return. Come on. Because of the rebellion that was in his heart. Right. Manifested itself mm -hmm. in the flesh. Yeah. The things that are in our heart will manifest themselves in the flesh. Amen. Right. That which with the tree will bring forth the fruit of that tree. Amen. Yeah. Thus by their fruit will you know them. Amen. So we learned all these things about David. And how that we might need to direct our prayer from Lord. Lord help me not to lie again. But Lord take oh, this wow. line out of my heart. Amen. Lay the axe at the root of the tree. You see, Gordon, if you want to kill a tree, just picking the fruit off won't do it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Just picking the fruit off ain't going to do it. You're going to have to go to the root of the tree and kill the thing. Yeah. Amen. Right. So let's look this morning at another man and let's look at his heart. Go with me to the book of Nehemiah. And it's hard for me whenever I get into the book of Nehemiah, it's hard for me not to preach the whole book because I fell in love with Nehemiah's writings a long time ago and it's always had a special place in my heart we get a glimpse see we, we got a glimpse into the heart of David because of his actions right people get a glimpse of, you might think you got everything hid but people get a glimpse into your heart when they see your actions right your words the things that you do oh you can hide a lot of stuff I'm not saying everything is transparent but you can't hide it all amen, amen. The Pharisees went around in nice, spiritual-looking clothes. Yeah. They dressed like they're supposed to. But when they opened their mouth, they gave away the hypocrisy that was in their heart. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. The sin that was in their heart. Yeah. So we get a glimpse into Nehemiah's heart and oh, oh. what a heart he had. Oh, yeah. In Nehemiah, the first chapter, it says the, in the beginning of the first verse, and we're going to look at a few things about Nehemiah this morning and then we're going to go on about our way and be the light we're supposed to be. Amen. Amen. It's true. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace, 
And Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Yeah. Now Nehemiah inquires of the people. Now he wasn't asking so he could get a rumor started. A lot of times that's the way it is today. People Amen. ask, how you doing? So they can get some juice on you, I guess. Amen. So how somebody else is doing. So they can find out if there's something they can tell. But Nehemiah, we see right away that he's concerned about the people of God. Amen. We will learn that Nehemiah had a heart that was concerned about the people of God. Oh, how as a pastor and a minister today of 30 years, I wish we had more people today that had a heart that was concerned about the welfare of other people. Amen? Instead of their own. Come on, preach. And listen. Verse 3. Let's see what happens whenever he tells Nehemiah the condition of God's people. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in yeah. great affliction and reproach. Yeah. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Yeah. And it came to pass, the Bible says, when I heard these words, I went on about my business because it didn't concern me. I don't think that's what it says. I said a quick prayer. Lord bless Jerusalem and the people that are there. Now I gotta go, I gotta go work. I have to go do my thing. Yeah. It said as soon as he heard those words, that it came to pass when I heard these words, that I sat down and I wept and mourned for certain days. And oh my goodness, there's that word. And fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Now let's see what actions. We'll see the actions of Nehemiah that give us a glimpse into the heart of the man. He wept, he mourned, he fasted. Yeah. See, everyone in this life too caught up in their own life to be concerned about the lives of others. Nehemiah was a busy man. He was the cupbearer of the king. He had some status right. in the town there. Yeah. He had some status. He was busy. But when he heard of the condition of God's people, listen to me. When you hear or when you see the condition of the church today, it ought to bother you. Right. Amen. Sure. When you turn on the television this morning and you hear all kinds of, 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 of blasphemous uh, doctrine, doctrines of devils coming forth from pulpits across our nation yeah. and thousands of people sitting in the seats and saying amen right. and hollering hallelujah and, oh. and cheering the preacher on, that ought to affect your heart today. Yeah. Amen. We need people that have a compassionate heart for the condition of God's people today. Amen. Nehemiah was such a man. Yeah. He was not one who, whenever he knew that the Jews were, were, were beaten down and that, that the city walls were torn down and were burned up and that they were in distress and they were in the midst of trial and they were in the midst of being, uh, being overtrodden and they were, they were in a bad shape. He was not a man that could just go on about his business as usual and not think about it. Well, I'll pray for him, but not do anything about it. He was a man of action. Amen? Yeah. Because of the burden that he had in his heart for those people that were in Jerusalem he had to do something about it. Right. We need some people that will see the condition or they'll see the work of God that needs to be done in the last days and won't just be able to ride the pew and feel comfortable about it, but we want to do something about it. Right. Nehemiah was such a man. Amen. And we get a glimpse into his heart that he had a burden for God's people. Right. But today, in the world that we live, every, every, life is so fast-paced. Everyone's got everything else to do. Amen. Everyone has everything else. They don't have time mm. for the kind of burden that Nehemiah had. Right. Nehemiah's burden was one that was birthed from his heart. Come on. There were no selfish motives involved. Nehemiah didn't send back word to the people. We just tell them to start positively confessing. Yeah. Tell them that they're thinking too negative. Amen. No, Nehemiah begin to pray and ask God, what can I do? Yes. God would like that from His people today. Amen. Not so much every time you hit your knee saying, God, what can you do right. for me? Mm -hmm. yeah. How about let's hit in our knees sometime and saying, God, what can I do for you? Yeah. Amen. Come on. 
John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Right. We need some Christians that will ask not what God can do for me, right. but what can I do for you, God? Come on. What can I do for the work? What can I do to help save lost souls Amen. in these last days? And Nehemiah had a heart of compassion. Yes, sir. He wept, he mourned, he fasted. Amen. Going down to verse 5, says, And said, I beseech thee. Now see, he starts praying. I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love Him and observe His commandments. Let thine ear be attentive, attentive, and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night. Oh, my, my, my. No self-esteem gospel to be found there. No selfish message to be found there. But he begins to pray and he begins to ask the Lord. He says, I'm praying day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants. Now listen to what he starts doing. He begins to repent. He begins to ask God for forgiveness for the sins of others. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So we see he had some repentance in his heart too. Amen. Amen. He had some old-fashioned conviction in his heart too. Amen. It bothers me today to see people who have no conviction. Yes, sir. Little Isaac was telling me about Duck Dynasty, and most Christians know what that is. I've never watched it. I tried to watch one show and didn't like it, so I turned it off. Mm -hmm. But many Christians love that, and they're all wrapped up in that. But they had a Halloween special this week. Mm -hmm. And little Isaac came to me, and he said, Duck, and he usually watches it with his daddy. Mm -hmm. He said, Duck Dynasty had a Halloween special. He said, I felt bad about it, so I didn't watch it. Mm. And I thought, oh, if we could bottle that. Amen. If we could get some adults with that kind of conviction today. Amen. Amen. Oh, my. It does something for me to see these children that have some conviction in their heart and conviction in their life. Amen. Amen. Because more and more, I'm seeing that adults have very little convictions left. Amen. Amen. They have been bombarded and brainwashed with the gospel of if it feels good, do it. And nothing is wrong and there's no line to cross. Till now, they don't feel bad about nothing. Come on, preach. Nehemiah was not such a man. Right. David was not. You ain't going to find a man of God in this Bible that was like that. Right. Every man of God that was worth his salt, every man of God that was worth putting, that, that, that did anything for God, yeah. had conviction in their life. Amen. Had repentance in their life. Right. Amen. True. So we see Nehemiah beginning to repent. Mm. He says, And confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. Amen. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant. Most so he's praying. He's asking God to remember. Listen to what he says in verse 8. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commanded thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Now, verse 9. But if... You return unto me and keep my commandments and do them. Though there were of you cast out of the uttermost part of the earth, a part of the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them into the place which I have chosen to set my name there. You know what he's saying? You know what he's praying? He's praying Second Chronicles, the seventh chapter that we always quote. Amen. If my people, which are called by my name, Amen. If they'll humble themselves, if they'll pray, if they'll seek my face, if they'll turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will heal their land. He's repenting. Nehemiah had a heart of repentance. And we see because of his actions, we get a glimpse into the heart of this man of God. He had a heart of compassion. He had a heart of conviction. He had a heart of repentance. Amen? Yeah. He was concerned about the welfare of God's people. So much so when we go to chapter 2, when he goes before the king like he has at other times, bearing the cup for the king. Listen what the king says. And it, listen in verse 2, I mean uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, I don't know how you pronounce that, but y'all going to have to get a different preacher if you need well-educated one. In the 20th year of the king, amen, <laughs> that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto him. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Now listen. Since Nehemiah had gotten the news 
He had been burdened for the heart, for the condition of God's people. Amen. Now he goes before the king and he is so burdened that the king notices. Listen to what the king says in verse 2. The king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is, no, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Right. Sorrow of heart. Amen. Then I was sore afraid, very sore afraid, and I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city and the place of my father's sepulchres lieth waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Did you hear what he said? Why should I not have a burden for the condition of the people of God? Amen? Amen. How can we live our life today and strive for the riches and the fame and the wealth of this world and go on about our business as if there's not souls dying and going to hell. Amen? How can we today walk around like we own everything and ever, the world is our oyster? Amen? Yeah. And that this is our best life now while people are dying and going to hell and God's people in the church are as almost bad a shape as the sinners anymore. Come on. He said, how can I be happy when God's people are in such a mess? Amen? Amen. How? Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth and waste? Mm. And the king said unto me, now he, the king asked him, he says, what is your request? What do you want done? He says, so I prayed to the God of heaven, I said unto the king, if it please the king, if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. Now when the king looks at him and says, what it is, exa is it exactly that you want me to do? You have to realize what a powerful thing that was for the king to ask you what's your desire. What would you have me to do? This reminds me of back when Elijah and Elisha had crossed over the river and Elijah was getting ready to be called up to heaven and he turns to the prophet and says, what would you have me do for you? Amen? Yeah. That was a powerful thing coming from the prophet. This was a powerful thing coming from the king. And instead of Nehemiah saying, oh, wait a minute. The king just asked me, what would I have him to do for me? I'm going to get a promotion here. Come on. I can get something better for myself here. I can get a raise in pay. Amen? I can get something better than, than the... Than the, the, the situation in my life. No, he wasn't concerned about himself at this time. He said that you would let me right. go to the city of my fathers Come on. and see what I can do to help the situation there. Amen. Amen. Oh, my, my, my. Verse 6 says, And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. So Nehemiah begins his journey to the city of God to see what he can do to help the people of God and the city of Jerusalem that had been torn down. Listen to what verse 10 says. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, now these are enemies of the servant of God, when they heard of it, when they heard what? When they heard that Nehemiah had a burden for God's people. When they heard that Nehemiah was seeking the welfare. That's what the Bible says. It grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. The devil would like nothing more for you today than to get wrapped up in me, myself, and I, my four and no more, and have no burden, no compassion, no love for anybody other than yourself. When this man got stirred up, when his heart had a burden for other people, the enemy was grieved because of it. Right. Your heart of compassion today will compel the enemy to mm -hmm. grieve. Amen. Amen. Your heart of compassion will compel you to be more than just a Sunday morning Christian. Mm -hmm. right. You won't be satisfied with letting somebody else do the work, somebody else do the giving, somebody else do the praying, somebody else do the fasting. No, you'll want to do something yourself. Right. You'll say, Lord, here am I. What can I do? That heart of compassion will move us to work for God and not sit on the sidelines or behind our church walls or on our couch or on our wallet 
while the work of God goes undone and while our brothers and sisters are hurting, while lost souls are going to hell. We see other things about Nehemiah in his book that give us a glimpse into his heart. We find that Nehemiah, you talk about a rare thing, he was a man of no compromise. Today there is more compromise in the body of Christ than ever before. For the sake of getting along, for the sake of being accepted by the crowd, for the sake of being economical, everybody getting along, everybody holding hands, everybody surrounded around the campfire, the Muslim, the, the Buddhist, the Jehovah's Witness, the Baptist, the Pentecostal, the Church of God, the Apostolic, all join hands and saying, Come by, Yah, my Lord. Calling Muslims their brother. Yeah. Amen? Listen to me. I don't want to hurt your feelings out there. But if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and put your faith in Him as the only way to heaven, you are not my brother. Amen. Amen. True. You are not my brother. As a matter of fact, we have a different daddy. That's right. Amen. Amen. Jesus looked at some people one time and He said, You're of your father. And they said, Well, I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. Our father's Abraham. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jesus found it. He was trying to be nice at first. Mm -hmm. He finally said, no, you don't understand me. You are of your father, the devil. All right. So if you don't know Jesus, if you had not been born into the kingdom, you've got a daddy different than mine. We ain't brothers. Amen. If you're following Allah today, we have a different daddy. Amen. Amen. <laughs> if you're following Muhammad today, we have a different daddy. Exactly. If you're following Mormonism today, we have a different daddy. Amen. Amen. If you're following Catholicism today, yeah. we have a different daddy. Amen. Amen. True. Because Mary is not the mother of God. All right. Amen. Come on. Allah is not the true God. Right. He's not the God of the Bible. True. Amen. Amen. Jesus was not just a prophet. Yeah. Jesus was God in the flesh. Amen. The Son of the begotten, the only begotten Son of God. Amen? Right. The only way to get to heaven. Well, Brother Believer, that's a little narrow minded. Well, Jesus said it is a narrow way. Amen? Amen. I didn't write the book, I only preach it. Yeah. Amen? Right. And if it says He's the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way, the truth, and the life, then that's what we got to go by. Mm -hmm. Amen? Listen to what he says in chapter, go with me to chapter 4, and I'm trying to hurry. Chapter 4, verse 6 is where I want to read. Nehemiah's heart of no compromise. We find him working on the wall, and he's got all the people stirred up now and got them all in the mood to work. And we can do this. God's with us. We can do this work. Through God, we can do this. Verse 6, it says, So built we the wall. I'm in chapter 4. And all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. And the people had a mind to work. Why? Probably before Nehemiah showed up, they were all sitting around licking their wounds. The Bible doesn't say nothing about them having a mind to work before Nehemiah got there. They were probably all gathered around singing gloom, despair, and agony on me. Don't know what we're going to do. Amen? Amen? But now the people have a mind to work because God's servant had a burden for them. Right. Amen? True. And it says the people had a mind to work, but it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah, now those are the enemies, remember that, we done talked about them once, they grieved because of what's going on. Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made and, the, and that the breaches began to be stopped. Then they were very wroth. Yeah. Now at first your actions will grieve the enemy. Mm. Then he'll go from being grieved to being mad. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now they're no longer just grieved, Brother Sleece. Now they're mad because of what's going on. Right. And the Bible says, and conspired all of them together mm -hmm. to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. So we see the enemy's mad now. And now they're conspiring, trying to figure out a way to stop them. See, the devil uses deceit probably more than he does any weapon that he has. 
He can try to fight you. He can try to do whatever. He can try to knock you down, stomp you. But he'd like to deceive you mm -hmm. into, into coming over and, and just, just wrapping his lies around your mind. Amen? Right. He's always a twister of God's word mm -hmm. and God's way. Mm -hmm. Amen. Go with me to chapter 6, verse 1. These guys keep popping up. As long as you keep doing something for God, these enemies are going to keep popping up. Amen. Yes, they ain't going to go somewhere and hide and say, well, just let him alone. Let him work for God. Yeah. Now, if you decide to sit on the couch and not do nothing, they'll say, leave him alone. We're going to bother this. This guy over here is one we got to be worried about. Amen. Yeah, Don't yeah. worry about him. All he does is go to church on Sunday morning and he live like the devil all week long and he ain't got no relationship. He ain't trying to help nobody. He's all worried about himself. We got him right where we want him. Mm -hmm. Leave yeah. him alone. Yeah. Amen. So the enemy's greed, now he's mad, and he's trying to figure out a way to stop Nehemiah. Right. Chapter 6. Now it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at the time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me. Now listen. Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages of the plain, in the plain of Ono. But Nehemiah said, but they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messengers to them. Right. <laughs> I like that. I sent messengers unto them, saying, I'm doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner all four times. <clears throat> the devil will keep asking you the same question, hoping your answer is different. Mm -hmm. Amen? Right. They sent unto him and said, Come down, let us go meet at the plains of Ono. Amen. And Nehemiah said, Oh no. Mm -hmm. Amen? I won't do it. The work has to be done. Why should the work cease while I try and reason with the devil? Amen? Amen? The devil wants you to reason with him. Amen. Amen? He wants to have a conversation with you. Right. The only conversation you need to have with him is in his written. Amen? Right. And then give him a piece of word that you want and go on about your way. Amen? True. I want to reason with you. The devil will try to get you to reason with him so he can get you to compromise. Now let's think about this. Is it really going to hurt anything to do it this way? Is it really going to hurt anything to leave the work for a little while? And every time the enemy sent that to Nehemiah, Nehemiah sent him a message back saying, No, sir, thank you. I, I don't want, I'm not coming down. The work cannot cease. Why should it cease while I come down to talk with you? Because I'm just going to come back and start the work over again. And I'm going to lose some valuable time dealing with you. We waste a lot of time just dealing with the enemy. Amen. Whether we should just, just put a smile and wave and go on by. Amen. Because he ain't going to learn anyway. He's going to keep trying to bring things to you to get you to compromise. But Nehemiah had a heart of no compromise. We can use some pre today who have a heart of no compromise. Amen. We can use some saints today in the pews that have a heart of no compromise. Mm -hmm. Nehemiah said no, this work is too important. We need some saints of God today that will get a burden in their heart for the lost souls that they will make sure they put their tithe in the offering plate. They will make sure that they put their offering in the offering plate. They will make sure that they pray for the lost souls. They will make sure that they spend time at the altar praying for the condition of the church and for lost souls today. We need some people with the kind of heart that Nehemiah had. Created me, Lord, a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Search me, O oh God. Search my heart. Try my thoughts. If there be any wicked way in me, take it out. Nehemiah was a man that had a compassionate heart. And through his actions, we see the fruit. Through his actions, we see a glimpse into his heart. Nehemiah was not satisfied with just sitting along the side sidelines and letting people go to hell. We got a lot of people today that in, they would rather sit on the sidelines than to gear up and go in <laughs> the battle and fight the warfare. True. We have people today that are more interested in money than they are souls. Amen. We have preachers by the droves that are more interested in getting your seat in their seat and your money in their plate 
And they are getting your soul into heaven. That's stout words this morning, but it's the truth anyway. How do you know that, Brother Billy? Because if they really cared about you, they'd preach to you the truth. Mm -hmm. Amen? If they really cared about you more than they did their popularity, they would get up this morning and preach to you the truth. Mm -hmm. Amen? Because mm -hmm. i got news for you. Preaching the truth ain't no easy road to hope. Mm -hmm. Amen? It don't gain you very many fans. You get a few. But not like the droves you get if you don't. We need some people today that have a burden for the lost. I want to read you this this morning in closing. Mm -hmm. A burden for the truth. A burden for the truth. That's Amen. right, Miss Lee. That's good. Amen. After a speech, pro-life activist Penny Lee <gasps> was approached by an old man, and this man weeping told her this story. I lived in Germany, in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. <clears throat> I considered myself a Christian. I attended church since I was a small boy. We had heard the stories of what was happening to the Jews. But like most people today in this country, we tried to distance ourselves from the reality of what was really going on. What could anyone do to stop it anyway? You see, Nehemiah could have had that thought. He could have thought, well, I can't do anything to help Jerusalem. It's too big a job for me. I can't do anything to help. And a lot of people have that attitude today. Right. This man went on to say that a railroad, <clears throat> a railroad track ran behind our small church, and each Sunday morning we would hear the whistle from the distance and then the clacking of the wheels moving over the track. Mm -hmm. We became disturbed one Sunday morning whenever we noticed there were cries coming from inside the train as it passed by. Mm -hmm. We grimly realized that the train was carrying Jews they were like cattle in those cars headed to slaughter. Mm. <clears throat> week after week, that train whistle would blow. Mm. We would dread to hear the sound of those old wheels because we knew that the Jews would begin to cry out for help as they passed by our church. Mm. It was so terribly disturbing. We could do nothing to help these poor miserable people, yet their screams tormented us. You see, that's the attitude of many today. I can't do anything. We can't do anything. Mm -hmm. Souls dying and going to hell, we sit by and let it happen without ever raising a finger to hell. We can do nothing for these poor miserable people, yet their screams tormented us. We knew exactly what time that whistle would blow, and we decided the only way to keep from being so disturbed by the cries was to start singing our hymns a little louder. By the time the train came rumbling past the church, we were singing at the top of our voices. If some of the screams did reach our ears, we just sang a little louder till we could hear them no more. Years passed and no one talks about it much anymore, but I still hear that train, that whistle and those cries in my sleep, said the old man. I can still hear them crying for help. God forgive us all who called ourselves Christians yet did nothing to intervene. Amen. The same thing can be said of the lost souls that are on their way to hell today. Right. God forgive us all who do nothing to intervene in that. Amen. God forgive preachers who are so backslidden and lost their self that they climb in behind the pulpit and all they give them is some marshmallow sermon. Instead of telling them there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun and millions are going to hell every day while the church sings a little louder. Mm -hmm. Sing a little louder. Mm -hmm. We don't want to hear the screams of the damned. Mm -hmm. Sing a little louder. Nehemiah was not satisfied with singing a little louder. He wasn't satisfied with, i got to get my mind off of this. It's tormenting me. No, he took on that burden. And he said, God, I'll do something if there's something I can do. Oh, my Lord. Penny Lee wrote a poem as if she had been one of the passengers on the train. I want to read that to you this morning. I found myself in anger. I cried out in despair. I pray, Lord, let them hear me. Let just one person care. I raised my voice to heaven as the train kept moving on. As we passed behind the churchyard, I could hear their worship songs. Mm -hmm. 
I cried out a little louder to the Christians there inside. But they raised their chorus louder, not hearing me outside. I knew they heard the whistle and the clacking of the tracks. They knew that I was going to die, and still they turned their backs. I said, Father in heaven, how can your people be so very hard of hearing to the cry of one like me? I shouted, please have mercy. Just a prayer before I die. But they sang a little louder to the Holy One on high. They raised their hands to heaven, but the blood was dripping down. The blood of all the innocent, their voices tried to drown. They had devotions daily. They functioned in my name. And they never even realized it was I upon that train. Unto the least of these, what you do for them, you also do for me. We need, if we don't have one, we need to pray, God, give me a burden for the lost. Give me a heart like Nehemiah. Put Nehemiah's burdens upon my shoulder, his burden upon my shoulder, and let me carry it, Lord. If there's something I can do, and there is, there's something all of us can do. Amen. Amen. You may not be the one that gets on the radio and preaches on the radio stations every week, but whenever you put money in the offering plate that pays for the airtime that allows us to preach on that radio station, you're as much a part of it as the voice that goes out across the airwaves. Whenever we send out the newsletters, you may not be the one that puts it together, you may not be the one that stuffs the envelopes and puts it in the mail, but whenever you give, whenever you pray, whenever you support, you're just as much a part of it as any of the rest of the process. People are dying and going to hell. We need to be stirred up about that. That should bother us today. Amen. That should bother us today. All across America, we sit comfortably in our churches while outside the world dies and goes to hell. Lost souls die. We just sing a little louder. The world goes to hell. We just sing a little louder. Babies aborted by the millions. We just sing a little louder. It's time we said, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Someone else this morning have something before we go.